My name is Tasha Bunch, and I'm an attorney in the Trademarks Legal Policy Office. Joining me today, we have Carrie Genovese, who is a senior attorney in the Office of Petitions. We have Robert Lavash, who is a senior attorney in the Legal Policy Office. Jessica Ludeman, who is an attorney in the Legal Policy Office. And Tanya Amos, who is the TEAS Administrator. Our um, TME pet TMEP editor, Kathy Kane, is unable to join us today. So I will go ahead and get us started talking about um, mandatory electronic filing and some of the specimen requirements. I will be talking about some of the changes to um, some of the rule changes um, based on mandatory electronic filing. So the first changes I will talk about are the changes to our filing date requirements. Um, we will now require, once the rule is in effect, we will now require that all applications filed under Sections 1 and or 44 be filed using the TEAS system unless the application is filed by a national of an exempt treaty country or a petition to accept a paper filing is granted. We also will require an email address for each applicant and we will require um, the practitioner, if there is one appointed, we will require their postal and email addresses in order to receive a filing date. There are also some changes to our filing options. The T's plus filing option will remain the same. However, the T's RF and T's regular options um, will go away and instead we will have the T standard option at $275 per class and that will now be the default electronic filing option. In addition, paper will remain the same at $600 per class. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the processing fee for falling off of T's plus. The fee will only be charged now for failing to comply with the T's plus initial filing requirements. The, for any submissions, subsequent um, paper filings, um, if they are granted on petition, they will incur a paper fee as well as a petition fee, but they will no longer incur the additional processing fee. TEAS Plus has some initial, an additional initial filing requirements um, dealing with entity standards. So the domestic partnerships must state the names and citizenship of the general partners. Domestic joint ventures must state the names and citizenship of the active members. And sole proprietorships must provide the state of organization and the name and citizenship of sole proprietors. Moving along to talk about correspondence. All filings relating to applications and registrations must be submitted via TEAS unless, once again, it's filed by a national of an exempt treaty country or a petition to accept a paper filing has been granted. However, for applicants um, that prior to the effective date of the rule that were filing under paper or TEAS regular, or for post-registration maintenance documents filed before the effective date of the rule, those filings are considered grandfathered in. For those filings, you are not required to provide an email address for correspondence or to file electronically. However, everyone should be aware that fax transmission is no longer permitted unless specifically directed by USPTO personnel. Um, Grandfathered filers should also keep in mind that all TEAS forms going forward will require the applicant's or, and regis or registrant's email address and the email address of a qualified practitioner if, if one has been appointed. If an applicant or registrant who's grandfathered in um, attempts to use a form, the form will not validate without providing this information. Furthermore, the office will presume that email communication is authorized going forward and they will no longer be allowed to file via paper without submitting a petition. For the correspondence address under the new rule, it will automatically be set to the applicant if no attorney is appointed and it will be set to the email address of the applicant or registrant in the file. If the applicant or registrant is represented, then the correspondence will be sent to the email address of the attorney of record unless one of three things happens. Um, a revocation or a new power of attorney is filed, the attorney has been suspended or excluded from practice, or recognition uh, uh, has ended. 
um, courtesy email addresses will still be permitted. There is an exception for Madrid applications um, for the re requirement for an email address at initial filing. Six, section 66A first action pubs will still be allowed um, under the new rule. However, for all subsequent submissions, they must be filed using the T system and must designate an email address for correspondence. In addition, sometimes certain specimens must be mailed in. These would be for non-traditional marks such as scent or flavor marks. If an applicant is submitting a specimen for these type of marks, they should indicate in their T's filing that the specimen will be mailed in. No petition requesting acceptance of this mailed in specimen will be required. Please note that this exception does not apply to sound or motion marks. The T's form permits attachment of specimens for such marks as electronic files. And now I will pass it to my colleague, Carrie. Thank you, Tasha. I'm going to talk about when you are unable to file electronically, whether it's because the T system has failed or the user system is having a problem. This would include widespread disruptions, natural disasters, and emergencies. The procedures and requirements you should follow depend on whether your attempt to file is before or on your filing deadline day. If your filing attempt is before the filing deadline, please try again later through T's. You can check the system status and availability page for any declared widespread outages and scheduled maintenance. If you're still having issues, contact the TEAS staff for technical assistance. You can email them at TEAS at USPTO.gov. And if you have questions for phone calls, you can call TAC. If your filing attempt is the same day as the filing deadline and your desired TEAS form or the TEAS fee payment processing system is unavailable, but the TEAS petition to director form is available, please use that form. You can file the petition electronically on the due date, including a written verified explanation of, why, of how your form was unavailable, evidence showing it was unavailable, the document you're attempting to file, and the electronic petition fee and any electronic fees for the filing you're trying to submit. If the filing attempt is the same day as your deadline and the, your T's form is unavailable, as well as the T's petition to director form, you will need to file your petition on paper, requesting acceptance of a paper filing. You should use the petition to accept paper cover sheet, which has a checklist of the requirements. This will be posted on our website. Include proof that TEAS was unavailable on the submission due date. The proof can, can consist of a printout of a screenshot showing the error message you received, or a statement of this fact with a signed declaration. You'll need to provide a $200 paper petition fee and any paper fees required for the document you're submitting. The signed certificate of mailing, which is also provided on the cover sheet, and the document you're attempting to file. And we will provide um, pre uh, preview PDFs for the T's forms that you can complete by hand and submit. If the filing attempt is the same day as the filing deadline and you're unable to log in, to your USPTO.gov account, please first see the troubleshooting tips on the FAQs website. If you're still unable, you can contact TAC. They have the ability to help you reset your password. And if it's still, you're still not able to log in in order to use T's, you will need to follow the instructions on the previous slide for filing your petition along with your paper submission. If the filing attempt is the same day as the filing deadline and the USPTO has declared a widespread service disruption, it will be posted on our system status and availability page, along with instructions about how to submit your filing to us. Gen in general, fax transmission is not permitted unless the USPTO has declared this type of widespread disruption and specifically instructed customers to submit documents via fax. Otherwise, it will be instructed to submit documents via regular mail. No petition or petition fee is required in this situation. If your filing attempt is the same day as the filing deadline and an extraordinary situation not covered by the other categories prevents you from filing electronically, 
You'll need to file on paper with petition, including an explanation as to why your situation qualifies as extraordinary, and you'll follow the same procedures outlined in the second scenario previously discussed. So just a brief synopsis of the three categories of petitions to the director under the new Rule 2.147. The first is the situation we've already discussed, that is, TEAS is unavailable on the date of a deadline for submission, and the applicant provides proof that TEAS was unavailable. The second category is for if, for example, an applicant or registrant did, was unaware of the mandatory filing, electronic filing requirements, and previously filed a paper submission that was not processed and was rejected by the USPTO. Within two months, you can file a petition to accept the previously submitted paper filing um, if you're unable to resubmit the document electronically by the statutory deadline. And this option only applies to particular documents that have statutory filing deadlines, such as a statement of use, a Section 8 or 71 um, declaration of use or excusable non-use. The, the third category is kind of the same catch-all category as mentioned on the previous slide. If the applicant or registrant doesn't qualify under one of the first two sections of the rule, they can request acceptance of a paper submission due to some other extraordinary situation. But please keep in mind, regularly scheduled T's maintenance or user error will generally not be considered an extraordinary situation. And the rules and policies regarding postal service interruptions and emergencies remain unchanged. And I will pass this to Robert Lavash, who's going to discuss specimen rule updates. Thank you very much, Carrie. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I'm going to be talking about updates to Rule 2.56, the specimen rule, which we included in the mandatory electronic filing rule package to um, better conform with existing statutory requirements and precedential case law regarding specimens. So first, let's talk about our update to the wording regarding labels and tags. You'll see with the underlined wording here that the rule now refers to a trademark specimen for goods having to be on containers, um, marks on the goods, on the containers, or packaging for the goods, on labels or tags affixed to the goods, or on a display associated with the goods. And this change was intended to incorporate the language uh, regarding use of commerce that's in uh, section 45 of the Trademark Act. Now, although the rule says labels or tags affixed, labels or tags that are not affixed may still be accepted uh, if on their face they clearly show the mark in actual use in commerce. So that means that the tag or label would have to include the informational matter that typically appears on a label for those types of goods. Um, so for food, it might be something like net weight or volume. Um, often on an actual label, you'll see a UPC barcode. Um, and then in other cases, uh, you might see lists of contents or ingredients. So we're looking for the indicia of use and commerce on that label if it's on a fixed. So if a label or tag does not clearly show actual use in commerce because it appears uh, for instance, to be merely temporary or it appears to be a mock-up, it will likely be refused under Trademark Act Sections 1 and 45 for failure to show the mark in actual use in commerce in connection with the goods. In addition, the examining attorney is likely to include with that refusal a request for information um, under Rule 2.61b to clarify use of the specimen in commerce. So here we've got a couple of examples examples of labels that we would still deem to be acceptable even though they are not shown affixed to the goods. Uh, in the first case, you have an unattached label for Crab Rangoon. It has a UPC uh, code. It has the mark. It has the, a number of uh, indicia that you would see on a, a label that's actually used in commerce. Likewise, on the second specimen, uh, we see a lot of product information a UPC label, safety information, and it's clear that this is the type of label that could be immediately applied to the goods in question. So both of these, under the amended rules, would still be acceptable. And here's yet another one that would be acceptable. This is a wine label. 
It has the usual information that wine labels either usually contain or are required to contain under other regulations. It has a UPC code, um, has the government warning. It looks like a label that could be applied to a wine bottle. So we would take this. These are examples of specimens that are likely to get a refusal under the rule. And the reason is they look temporary or mocked up. It's not clear that these are labels that are actually used uh, on the goods in commerce. They have a temporary mocked up look to them. In this case, these specimens are likely to get a refusal and a request for information. Um, it is still possible that the applicant could respond and explain that yes, this is indeed how we affix our labels and provides additional evidence to, to show to show that. In that case, the examining attorney may withdraw the refusal. So let's move on to 2.56B2, uh, which is the service mark requirements. We've now updated that, that rule language to incorporate wording that's consistent with recent TTAB decisions and examination policy. So now we refer to use of the mark uh, in the performance or rendering of the service services, and we refer to the mark needing to show the specimen needing to show a direct association between the mark and the services. In this first example, we show a specimen that does show a direct association of the mark and the identified services. In the upper left corner of the screen, there you see the the mark Sibirix. And in the middle right portion, you see a direct reference to the identified services, digital marketing and advertising. So in this case, the direct association is shown and the mark that specimen would be acceptable under the rule. In this example, which is a bit more nuanced, um, we have the mark appearing on the specimens and the identified services are retail store services featuring medical devices. These specimens are likely to be refused as not showing a direct association because, again, we've identified retail store services, but the specimens in use here appear to be invoices and a sales addendum that typically you would not see um, when used in the retail store um, environment. It's not typically the type of, of materials that are associated with that, and there's otherwise no direct uh, reference to the retail store services. So in that case, the specimens are likely to be refused. Uh, moving on to Rule 2.56C, um, we've updated our rule regarding web page specimens. We now require that each web page specimen include the URL, URL and the access or print date of, that, um, of the web page that's excerpted. So here's just an example of that. In the upper left corner, you see the access date. Uh, further to the right, you see the URL. URL. Um, if the web page specimen contains the URL and access date in this manner, it's likely to comply with the rule. And now uh, we just have a couple seconds to switch over to our other presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to Jessica Ludeman. Robert mentioned I'm going to be discussing the tease form updates that are being made in conjunction with the mandatory electronic filing rulemaking. Today we're going to discuss the changes that affect all the forms, the initial application forms, the petition forms, the post-registration forms, and the correspondence and attorney and domestic representative forms. First, we'll start with changes affecting all the forms. One of the biggest changes you'll notice is that the owner email address field is now mandatory. If you've used RT's forms before, you've probably seen that we have a checkbox underneath the um, owner and attorney email address fields to provide authorization for the USPTO to communicate. Under this new rulemaking, email authorization is presumed. So we've removed the checkbox for authorizing email communication, 
when you provide an email address for either the owner holder, the attorney, or the domestic representative. We also have revised the correspondence information page in all the TEAS forms. We've removed the postal address, the telephone number, and fax number fields. The name and primary email address fields for correspondence are not editable on this page. They populate from either the attorney's email address, if an attorney is appointed, otherwise from the trademark owner's email address. You can enter up to four secondary email addresses for courtesy copies of USPTO communications on this page. Similarly, the validation page previously has had an email for acknowledgement field that the user could edit to, to enter the email address to receive the e-receipt for filing. This field has now been renamed the primary email address for correspondence, and there is a new secondary email address field to make it easier to identify the recipients of the filing receipt. You cannot change these email addresses on this page. These email addresses are used to send the T's filing receipt. Email, these email addresses pre-populate with the primary email address for correspondence. Again, this is either the appointed attorney's email address or the trademark owner's email address if an attorney is not appointed. And again, the secondary email addresses, if any, were, will also appear here. You should also note that most TEAS forms now contain both an owner and an attorney information page. This will make it easier to provide required information without having to access a separate form. You'll be able to provide attorney bar membership information, an attorney email address, or an owner email address on most forms. We also have a new owner information page for our Madrid filers. The TEAS forms will include this version for all 79 series files. It'll permit the addition or update of an owner holder email address. Please note that changes to the owner holder's postal address must continue to be made using the WIPO MM9 form. A separate domicile address can be provided for 79 series owner holders in the new change address or representation form. We'll discuss both the domicile address and the change address or representation form a little bit later. Another addition to the forms is a separate field for recognized Canadian attorneys and agents. Currently, Recognized Canadian attorneys and agents have to be entered in the other appointed attorneys field on the attorney information page. Now they can be entered uh, separately in the recognized Canadian attorney agent field. Next, we'll move on to changes to the initial application forms. As we mentioned earlier in this presentation, the filing options have changed. TEAS RF has been renamed TEAS Standard, and TEAS Regular is no longer a filing option. There is now going to be a new single initial application form for TEAS Plus and TEAS Standard. A domicile address can be provided for the trademark owner. This address is kept private by using a new field. We also have new fields for the sole proprietor. These provide clear prompts for required information. As I mentioned, the TEAS Plus and TEAS Standard initial application form is now a single combined form. On the wizard page, you'll select the desired filing option. You can toggle between these filing options while in the form if needed by returning to the wizard page and simply clicking on the correct radio button and moving back through the form. We also now have a new domicile address field. We've enhanced the initial application forms and the new change address or representation form to allow owners to provide a separate domicile address. Although the USPTO presumes that the owner's street address and owner's domicile address are the same, 
If they are not, you may enter a separate address in the domicile address field. This address is not publicly viewable in the USPTO's TSDR database. We made this addition in response to concerns from our customers about privacy. As I said, it's not viewable in the TSDR database, and this includes both on the status tab and in the documents themselves. On the owner information page, we have new fields for the sole proprietors. Domestic sole proprietors will now enter their name in a text field. The sole proprietor's citizenship is separately selected from a drop-down menu. Now we'll discuss changes to the petition forms. We have a revised petition to the director form. This form now has dedicated fields instead of an open text box. The reasons for the petition and any necessary updates to the application or registration that are the subject of the petition are clearly identified. On the wizard page, you'll enter your serial number or registration number, and on the next screen, you'll select the reason for your petition. There are two versions of this. There will be reasons for pre-registration filings and post-registration filings. You'll select the reason for your petition using the appropriate radio button. And then you'll answer questions to indicate the type of information you want to provide within the petition. The wizard questions will help you build a personalized form with dedicated fields for filing information. Next, we'll discuss changes to the post-registration forms. The post-registration response to office action form has been enhanced to a, a dedicated field form. You'll select the filing that prompted the office action, and the wizard questions will allow you to build a customized response. Again, you'll use dedicated fields instead of an open text box for providing your response. Similar to the petition to the director, you'll select using radio buttons the dedicated form options for your filing type. You'll choose your option and then complete your form. Next, we'll discuss changes to correspondence and attorney and domestic representative forms. We have consolidated six closely related forms into one. This will allow you to complete a single form for several related actions. This new form is called the change address or representation form. We have included the revocation appointment of attorney and domestic representative form, the change of domestic representative's address, withdrawal of domestic representative, change of owner address, change of correspondence address, and the replacement of attorney form. This new form uses role-based logic. You'll enter your serial or registration numbers and then will identify yourself as either the owner, attorney, or domestic representative by selecting the appropriate radio button. Questions appropriate to the identified role will appear based on the status of the files in the USPTO's database, and the user will indicate what data should be updated. On this screen, we're showing you the types of updates that can be made in your application or registration. You can update contact information for the trademark owner holder, an already appointed attorney, or an already appointed domestic representative. This includes updating attorney bar information. You can appoint a U.S. licensed attorney to represent you before the USPTO or appoint a domestic representative. You can appear for the first time as attorney of record on behalf of an owner holder who is not currently represented. You can replace the attorney of record with another already appointed attorney. You can revoke the power of a previously appointed attorney, remove a previously appointed attorney from the record because the power is ended, or withdraw as domestic representative. Last, we're going to discuss the deployment. T's and T's I will be unavailable on Saturday, December 21st from 12.01 a.m. until 8 a.m. Eastern Time to incorporate the mandatory electronic filing changes. You must file all saved forms and e-signature forms by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday, December 20th, 2019 so that your data is not lost. If you do not file all of your saved forms by that time, you will have to start the process again with new forms. 
If you have any questions about the information we discussed during this webinar, you can email tm underscore webinar at uspto.gov and we'll be happy to answer questions. Great. I'm now going to take a look in our mailbox and see what we have as questions that have come in. My name is Tanya Amos and I'm the TEAS administrator. <clears throat> the first question that we have is, it looks like it's for Jessica, it's, is the domicile information only masked if I use the new domicile address field? That's a great question, and yes, that is correct. You must use the dedicated domicile address field in order for your information to be masked. If you include that address in any other miscellaneous field or otherwise in a response, it will not be masked within that document. The next question is related to specimens. It is, does the URL and access data have to be on the specimen or can it be somewhere else in the filing? Bob, would you be able to answer that question? Sure. Ideally, we would like it to be on the specimen itself, but that's not a requirement. You can include it elsewhere in the, in the filing, the application or the response to office action, or you could even include it in a subsequent uh, filing. Uh, the next question that's come in is, I see that email authorization is presumed. What if I previously did not authorize email but provided an email address? What happens after mandatory electronic filing? Jessica, can you answer that question? Yes. So even if you previously did not provide email authorization, once you come in and use the TEAS form, the forms are automatically presuming email authorization. So once you access and use and file using the forms, email authorization is now presumed. Great. Um, and we have a, another question, which is, how do I change the email address on the validation page for the filing receipt? I guess, Jessica, you'd probably be in the best shape to answer that one. It's another good question. Um, similar to how I explained that the email addresses were not editable, editable on the correspondence information page, they are also not editable on the validation page. So if you do need to make a change to the primary email address for correspondence, whether it's the one that you see appearing on the validation page, same as the one that's appearing on the correspondence information page, you would have to go back in the form to make that edit. If you have an appointed attorney, you'll have to edit the email address for your appointed attorney. If you are an unrepresented owner, you would edit your owner email address. The secondary email addresses, the courtesy copies, those are edited on the correspondence information page. Okay, we now have a question about um, evidence. It's what type of evidence must be provided to show that TEAS was unavailable? Carrie, would you be able to answer sure. that? Sure. Um, so evidence could consist of uh, the screenshot of the error message you received when you attempted to file a TEAS form and were unable to do so. It could also consist of email correspondence between an applicant and registra or registrant and the TEAS staff, um, or just a statement saying I was unable to access TEAS along with the assigned declaration under Rule 2.20 um, with all the standard declaration language. Okay, um, and we have another question that just came in. Um, Bob, I think this one is for you. It's, at what stage in the application is the applicant email required? At what stage is the applicant email required? Right. Oh, as soon as you file it. Right. <laughs> yeah, so if, you, if, if you're unrepresented, you need to provide your email address um, and if you are represented by an attorney, you're going to need to provide your email address and the attorney's email address. I should say the attorney is going to provide that information if you have an attorney. Okay. Um, and uh, the next question that I have um, is, why would I be able to file a TEAS petition form if the other forms are unavailable? I can answer that, I, or attempt to. Um, so sometimes 
there could be a situation where there's a glitch with one particular tease form or you're unable to submit the tease form you're trying to submit because of a payment processing error. And so the tease petition to director form, the new one, has an option that you can select. It's a radio button option that you encountered an error when trying to process fees on another tease form and you'll be able to proceed through the form that way. So it, we're hoping that that would help customers get, get something in the door if they're having issues with their other tease forms and um, you know, pay the lower electronic filing fees. All right, we have a question about issues that might occur after the deployment. What do I do if I have an issue after the deployment? Jessica, can you answer that? So just as you're doing now, you'll do also after the deployment. If you are having technical problems, please email tees at uspto.gov. Okay. Um, we have a question about the new car form. The, the question is, we have different radio buttons for the owner, the attorney of the record, and the domestic representative. In this new form, can you click on two options at the same time, or is it a, a single option? It is a single option. So you will have to select one radio button identifying your role in either the application or registration. Okay. Um, and if you appoint an attorney, who are you sending correspondence to? Tasha, can you answer that question? Sure, I can answer that question. Um, correspondence will be sent to the um, the email address of the attorney of record. Okay. And the next question is, where do I get information on outages? Carrie? I can answer that. Um, it's our current website. I believe right now it's called Filing Documents During an Outage. Um, it will be renamed in the near future, but we will provide lots of information on that page about how to submit your documents if there's an outage. And always to check the system status and availability page um, for our current status. Okay, we have a question on, can I send my document in via email? Tasha? Um, sure, I can answer that question. Um, formal communications still cannot be sent via email, only informal communications. Okay, and we have another question that's come in that is, how are you keeping owner email addresses private? And I can answer that question because I was intimately involved about uh, three or four months ago, we had a TSDR release where on the status page, we masked the owner email address of uh, unrepresented owners. So if you go into TSDR now and you go to the status page, um, it, you'll notice that the owner email address is masked. Um, let me see if we have any more questions that uh, came in. Um, oh, here's a question on what do you recommend we do to avoid filing on paper? Carrie, this sounds like a petition. Sure. Type of thing. Um, the first tip would be do not wait till the last day, <laughs> um, just to make sure that you give yourself plenty of time. Um, Otherwise, you know, um, keep sign up for TM alerts. If there's some sort of major outage or anything like that, we would send a TM alert and the, bookmark the system status and availability page. And also, we will provide on our on the outages page. There will be a downloadable PDF for the petition to accept paper. You can download that and save that on your computer in the event of an emergency. Um, about it. Okay. <laughs> um, our next question is, how do I indicate that I will be mailing in a specimen for a non-traditional mark? Um, Bob, can you answer that one? Um, well, when you do that, you're going to have to file electronically, but you have to indicate in the application that you are separately submitting your specimen by, by mail. And I believe there's a, there's there's a, a checkbox check box that you correct. should check off to indicate that. Mm -hmm. And let's see if there's any more questions. Um, here's one. Um, 
If I was a T's regular application and I file my response electronically and have to add a class, what is the fee that I'll be paying? I can answer that one. Um, so if a, an applicant that originally filed T's regular and they submit electronically to add a class, they will now pay the default T standard filing fee of $275 per class. Okay. And here's one that just came in. It says, there is a time delay from when an application is filed until the application is accessible in the T system. Will the new petition form allow the user to enter a serial number for an application not otherwise available in the T system in the days following the new application filing? And I'll, I'll go ahead and okay. answer that question. <laughs> Um, the answer is unfortunately no. Once the T's application is filed, it still has to go through our back-end processing and be assigned a serial number before it'll be eligible for use of the petition form. If you have a particular scenario that requires immediate assistance, please don't hesitate to email T's at USPTO.gov. We'll gladly assist you. Um, let's see if we have any more that have come in. Um, what if I filed on paper or a T's regular application before December 21st? Am I obligated to file electronically? I can answer that question. Um, as I talked about in my, um, on my slides, for applicants that filed on paper or T's regular, you are considered grandfathered in um, at the time of the rule, and you can continue to file on paper if you so choose. However, you should be aware that if you do use the T's form, it will require you to submit an email address in order to submit the form, and going forward, you will be required to meet the, the mandatory electronic filing rule requirements. Okay. Um, and let's see if we have any new questions that have come in. Okay, we have a question. Uh, this is more about the U.S. Council rules. It says, we are a U.S. corporation using an attorney. Why do we need to provide attorney bar association information? I thought this was only for foreign applicants. Bob, would you be able to answer? Um, yeah, sure. Um, no, the rule does require attorney bar info for attorneys that are appearing as primary attorney in the record. So that is in the U.S. Council uh, rule and the reason for it is we need to be able to verify that the person who has identified themselves as an attorney is an attorney and is the attorney that they say they are. Um, so it's to help us sort of police some of the improper activities that we've been seeing in the last couple of years. Okay. Let's see if we've got anything else. Uh, the question is, with this new CAR form, the correspondence address and attorney representation form, will there still be an open text box field in the form? Um, it depends on the type of information that you're trying to provide. For the most part, this is a dedicated field form, and so there will be prompts for all of the information that you would want to provide. There will be an owner information page, an attorney information page, a domestic representative's information page, and those pages are um, crafted specially for the type of change you're trying to make. So the attorney information page may be modified depending on whether or not this is a replacement versus an appointment of a newly appearing attorney. Um, and the, there's now a question about, this goes back to petitions evidence. Uh, I think mm -hmm. this is Carrie. It's um, if the problem, if there's an outage and the problem is on the customer's end as opposed to the USPTO's end, what type of evidence do they need to submit? In general, a declaration saying that you had an internet outage that day or whatever the problem may be, a power outage, that would be fine as long as it's a statement accompanied with a signed declaration. Thank you. Um, 
We've got a question asking us if there's any plan to integrate into a single form, a request to divide, an extension request, mm -hmm. and a statement of use. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take that question. I'll certainly add it to our backlog. Um, we did not have the time to do this, and our next release will be dedicated to more login issues. So um, I, I certainly think this is something that we can explore for a future release down the line. Um, please keep the questions coming. We have a few more minutes. Uh, the, here's a, a, a question. Um, it's, if an applicant registrant is represented by an attorney, is it still required to include an email address for the applicant registrant? And then the second part to that question is, can you use the attorney's email address in the applicant, the owner email address field? Um, so as far as using the, um, the owner and attorney email address as being the same, that we cannot do. Um, the rule very specifically states that we need the individual email address of both the trademark owner and the appointed attorney. And I'm sorry, was there a, the, a second part to that question? I think you answered the first part, right? The, yeah. Whether they needed to have an applicant email address in right. addition to an attorney email address, yes. and the rule requires both. Yes, and the form itself is going to prompt you for that information. If you do enter an owner email address on the owner information page that then matches the email address that's entered at the attorney information page, you will receive an error that will prevent you from moving forward in the form because these email addresses should be individual to the specific person. Okay. We have a question asking us, um, what are the different types of widespread outages? Can we give an example? Well, in the past, I would say um, we had a huge power outage at the USPTO um, in 2015, I think. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was one of those <laughs> situations. Um, I don't remember anything more recently, do you, where we declared an outage? No. That was the most recent one. And then we have an, another person we, uh, that is asking if you have to submit an email address for the applicant registrant if they're represented by an attorney, and the answer again is yes. yes. The rule requires both an applicant registrant, the owner email address, as well as the attorney email address. Um, let's see if there's anything um, else that's out there. Um, there's a, a question about uh, where are the forms located if the system goes down? We will not be able to access them as, if T's is down, so how do we find the information that we need in order to file our petition? Right. So this is um, a great question and something we hope doesn't happen, but um, that's why I encourage everyone to bookmark the page where um, all the outages information is gonna be posted and also to download a PDF copy of the petition to director cover sheet, which will have the checklist of all the requirements. And I don't, Tanya might know better where the PDFs are posted for the, the T's form previews that would also be a good thing to save um, so that you have them at your disposal. So, you know, if you're filing a response to office action, there will be a preview PDF created that you can, you know, fill out by hand and send in in the, in the event our website is down. Right, and right now those T's PDF previews are located underneath each of the relevant T's forms. So okay. underneath the initial application form, you'll see the preview PDF, um, we, we have plans to make them easier to find and... And to add them on the outages page, right. too. So, so. so in a few weeks, you'll, you'll see yeah. them in a more centralized uh, location. Um, we've got another question. This is about, the, um, about um, changing address. It says, 
if you simply want to file a change of address for the law firm that represents the applicant or registrant, do you need to include the owner email with that law firm change of address? That's a good question. Um, if you have not previously provided an owner email address, the form will prompt you um, when you access that initial set of wizard questions. Uh, you'll be presented with options for things like, do you want to update the information for the trademark owner? Um, do you want to update the information for the already appointed attorney? If you answer yes to only the question for updating the information um, of the appointed attorney, when in fact you also have information missing for the trademark owner, you are going to receive an error message telling you that you must answer yes to the question for providing whatever the missing information is for the trademark owner. So then both pages will present um, within the form. Um, we have a, a new question that's about um, owner email addresses. It's, if the applicant is a corporation and not an individual, what email address should be used? And I, I, I think that that's, it has to be an email address that is owned by the corporation so, as opposed to a third party. So whatever your corporate email address is, that's the email address that you would include in the, the form. Do you all agree? Yeah, it has to be a, a contact person at the corporate entity, I would say, their email address. Right. And we've, we've had um, a, a lot of questions about the, the slides and, and the, the, um, where they are located. Um, I wanted to let you all know that the slides are currently on the events page on the USPTO website and that we are going to post this recording so that you can uh, review it. It'll be posted as soon as it's available, so in a, shortly. Um, please let us know if you have any other questions. There is a slight delay from uh, when they come in and when I'm seeing them. Do you have, guys have any other things that you think we could um, raise while we wait for the, the mail? My <laughs> server's a little slow. <laughs> ah, here's one. We have, th this question appears to be related to login. It, it's asking um, whether um, you can use the authenticator app to log in as opposed to waiting for, for an email when, when um, you log in. So when you sign up to, to log in to the TEAS forms, you, you have to use two-factor authentication, which means the USPTO will be sending you a code. And that code will come to you either by email or by phone or by use of an authenticator app. And you're right, if you, if you want, do not want to wait for the email to arrive because it, there can be a delay either with your email server or with the USPTO server, you can download a free authenticator app from, from your, uh, one of your, the providers out there and use that and it'll gener automatically generate a six digit code. There's instructions if you go to our website up in the upper right hand corner in the myuspto.gov section, there are instructions for how to download an authenticator app and use it to log into our system so that you don't have to wait for an email from the USPTO. And if you have any issues when trying to log in or set up uh, either the password or, or receiving the six-digit code, please don't hesitate to email us at tease at uspto.gov and we'll gladly assist you. Okay, if there are no more questions right now, um, we will um, 
close the session and thank everyone for their time. And if after the session it ends up that there are more questions that come in, we will post them as well on the web page so that uh, you can see the, the answers. And if you have any individualized questions, please don't hesitate to email us at tees at USPTO.gov. We'll gladly answer all of your questions and any that you can think of in the upcoming weeks. And uh, we look forward to mandatory electronic filing and are sure it will be a smooth transition. Thanks a lot and have a nice day.